All right, let's rock. Rue, Gabby, thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Nice to have you. Gabby, I know you're thrilled about talking on camera in front of people. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> but it, it'll be great. So um, we're going to talk about the Surf Simply Kids Club, which is a really cool project. Uh, but for people who aren't familiar with Surf Simply, Rue, can you give us kind of a super abbreviated version of, of how you got to where you're at today? Uh, okay, so the, I guess the quick version is I started teaching surfing back in the 90s in the UK. And I was doing a lot of entry level surfing lessons like, you know, most people are familiar with and also doing a lot of video coaching with young competitors, which people may not be familiar with, but is also fairly common. And it just became really obvious to me that there wasn't anything um, sort of connecting that entry level 1% with that top level competitor 1%, like the 98% of surfers in between, just coaching for them didn't really exist. And, and surfers who fall into that kind of 98% of surfers category were quite understandably skeptical about taking lessons because they had done perhaps and didn't get any value out of it or didn't see somewhere that was really providing that value. So I really wanted to set up something that did that. And we came up with what is now the Surf Simply Tree of Knowledge, this big 10 meter long infographic that kind of pieces all those skills together. And um, the big problem that I had being in Europe was that um, you could only be open seasonally and, at, uh, and and I, I'm going to make this short and kind of come back around to why we're here, but this is quite a big piece of that puzzle. Um, if someone's a, the way that we teach surfing is quite unique. And if someone is an experienced surf coach and an experienced teacher and an experienced surfer, it still takes us about two years to train them to become a surf simply coach. Now, if you're working in Europe and just teaching seasonally or anywhere teaching seasonally, and you've got people that are that are motivated and intelligent and hardworking and curious. At some point, they're going to want to do things in life that cost money, like have cars and kids and families and all that stuff. And a seasonal salary just doesn't look that good. So if you, if you want to get people that are really good and you want to keep them for long enough that you can train them, you have to have a year-round income. Otherwise, the business model didn't work. So I started looking for places that I could do that. And I spent seven or eight years going around Hawaii and Australia and Indonesia and Europe and everywhere. And I found Nosara back in 2007 and I moved here. And yeah, this place ticked all the boxes. And so I started doing lessons out the back of my car uh, back then. And I would rock up at the beach at like six in the morning, do a lesson at six, eight, ten, another one at two, another one at four, pack up, drive back to my little house in Pilata, trying to learn how to build one of these like website things. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a year, had a little shop, took on another coach, borrowed some money, bought a bit of uh, hillside next to what's now Bodhi Tree with some cabinas on it and started to get enough people online that we could do the online thing and not need the shop front anymore um, and then kind of built that up. And then a couple of years ago, borrowed some more money, went more into debt and, and built a, a second version of the Surf Simply Resort. And as I say, now the team is like 35 people. Um, and yeah, and you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that I'm just incredibly proud of. We still keep our numbers really small. We, you know, the usual surf school business model is to either increase how many people you're taking in or to open new locations. And we didn't want to open new locations because it's a lot more fun making this thing better rather than making it bigger. And we didn't want to increase our numbers because the surf school I used to work at in the UK started with six coaches and about 30 or 40 people on a busy day. And when I left like a decade later, we would have uh, 600 people on a busy day. There was 30 coaches. And I, and I saw the way that impacted other beach users. And so one of the hills that I stuck a flag in right when I opened Surf Simile was we're going to, you know, obviously everyone likes fewer people in the water. And we thought, you know, we're going to be the first surf school in the world that just caps our numbers. And we have 12 surfers a week um, just to minimize our impact on other water users. And uh, so we've just stayed small. We've got pretty expensive now. Uh, and that's how we've managed to, you know, pay everyone a good salary and 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 get the team, get the team on a on a good livable wage. Um, yeah, and I'm and I'm really proud of what we've done. Right on, man. Um, some other time when we have more time or we do a different episode, I'd love to understand and hear more about staying small deliberately and some of the choices you've made. But having watched it all and most all of it unfold, I think the biggest key memory points that I have is when you went from the trailer to the shop. And then when you went from the shop to no shop, that was, that was like the big one. You were like, Nope, 
done with the shop. We're going to operate out of this. We're going online and we're going to operate in this manner. That was a big transition. It was a gutsy move, I thought. And it seemed like it worked out really well. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. Honestly, yeah. it was absolutely terrifying. I mean, when we first moved from the shop to the resort, I didn't know if it was going to work. And there was weeks where I was like, you know, if we don't get a booking in the next two weeks, we just, we're done. That's it. We're finished. And I think honestly, any, anyone who owns a successful business and doesn't acknowledge that they could have absolutely failed but not for a roll of the dice at some point is being a bit disingenuous. So like I've been, I've worked really hard and we've put a lot of thought into it, but you know, me and the whole team, I think we've been incalculably lucky as well. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. We'll tell that more of that story some other day, but thank you for sharing that. And what we're going to move into now is talking about the kids club. So where'd the kids club come from and why are you guys doing this? Well, um, should, uh, should I give it like a, a quick history and a concept and then you want to talk about it like a little bit more what you're doing with the day-to-day stuff? Okay, let's do that. All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, when, we, when, when I first opened back in 2007, we just started doing uh, free surf lessons on the weekend for any local kids that wanted to come along. And we'd run it for like a year or so, maybe, maybe a year and a half, I forget. And it was really, really cool, but it was just like a huge amount of work. And when we shut the shop and we moved to a location further away from the beach, when we opened the first version of the resort, it was just, it became logistically impossible. And Saturday was our changeover day when guests were arriving and leaving. And there was just a team of four of us. Um, and it was just impossible. And we sort of handed the club over to some other people and it slightly lost momentum and kind of fizzled out. But even that, even then, like years later, I would walk into, I don't know, like Super Nosara or, or I'd go into the Ferretaria and someone would come up to me and be like, oh, hey, Rue, I started surfing with your club like all those years ago, you know? Mm. And by this time, they're all in their 20s, these... these so it stuck with you, that, that had roots. And it was and it was just, it felt really good, you know? And like, I mean, from a very selfish point of view, I've lived here longer than anywhere that I've lived in my life. So this feels like home, you know? And, and I want to be an old guy here. And when I walk into a bar or a restaurant as an old guy, I want people to be pleased to see me, you know, that's... Part of the reason, selfishly, why we do so much stuff, you know, with the community projects and being involved with the community. They're all humans and, and being connected to everyone around us is just the most important thing. So anything I can do to help bring the community together, I always think it's important. So anyway, when we moved to this new lot, we just had this little triangle of land opposite where Coconut Harry's is. And um, it just seemed like the perfect opportunity to reopen the club that we used to do there. So... Uh, Esfera Sustainability, who I think maybe you know. Shout out to them. Yeah, they they helped us design the little trailer and got the trailer all organized. And then, um, yeah, we got the boards in there and found a bunch of people who are happy to commit to every Saturday and, and be involved as coaches. And we really needed someone who was going to do the nightmarishly impossible task of trying to coordinate, you know, which kids are coming and who's bringing them and who's coming each week. And so, sorry, just a little aside. We also work really closely with Nosara Surf Team, which Kali Artavia runs. And, you know, we, we sponsor them and, and all of that stuff. And they really focus on the kids that are really, like, uh, really good and, like, competing and want to take surfing really seriously. So with the Surf Simply Kids Club, we sort of wanted to do the opposite and just get as many kids to have at mm-hmm. least uh, enough of an understanding of the ocean that if they're not going to go on to be competitors or, you know, great surfers, at least surfing and enjoying being in the ocean at Guyana's is something that they've just got for the rest of their lives you know so that was that's the goal with that club so we sort of we actually have kids come like it's all free for the kids right so what Gabby does is she'll rotate um who's coming each week so that whoever has never surfed before always gets priority Mm -hmm. and then the kids that have come recently they sort of go to the back of the back of the line so that we're always trying to get as many new kids into surfing as possible that's really cool so Gabby how do you pull that off I really enjoy it you have um, a lot of WhatsApp messages. I yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like uh, being, uh, calling me and writing me. And it's really cool to have a project or the experience to run this project because, you know, it's um, something for the community. And like half the, the kids, they never been in the water or they're afraid or they don't feel comfortable in the water or like. Um, so it's, it's really cool to to see them like, you know, come like every Saturday and they don't know how to do it and like they come be part of this um but yeah it's a project when you know um danny and rue talked me about it i was like yeah i'm in like it was really really cool project so i hope uh more kids will join and be part of this because it's it's really cool so 
how do you find the kids that you bring out on Saturdays? We distribute flyers in all the public uh, schools. And, you know, they, as Ru say, we give priority to the kids that never served before. So what we do, uh, we, we have a flyer that we distribute with the moms and we pass the word and we tell them to invite more kids to join the club. What's the most popular demographic? Is it girls, boys, a certain age? Uh, it's a mix, actually. Um, some weeks is more girls, some, some weeks are more boys, but like, I feel it's like 50 and 50. Yeah. And and actually, I I guess I should say just for any listeners that are interested in having their kids come along. So the criteria for coming along to the club are just that you have to be a Costa Rican resident Mm -hmm. and you have to be between eight and 14. Okay. And that's it. Yes. And the reason that we made it, uh, that you have to be a Costa Rican resident was because, and this is kind of a, a bit of a difficult one to navigate politically, right? The idea is that we want to take kids that wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to surf mm-hmm. and get them in the ocean. And what we didn't want to do was like end up with a lot of kids who are already surfing and, you know, their parents live by the beach and maybe they've moved down here and they've got all of that opportunity anyway. And then the parents are just like, oh, we can shove them in here as another activity. That gotcha. So it's not just a babysitting service at all. It's more of a you get them involved and you want to make sure the right people are landing. Right. And it's, yeah. and it's And it's really, I mean, to do some kind of like means testing like in terms of what is this kid's accessibility to surfing without this club (laughs) is just an impossible thing to try and do so we had to draw a line somewhere and we decided like let's just make it for costa rican residents and that's that's going to be the rule then it kind of keeps it clean and simple that's really cool is anyone getting upset at you gabby for their kid can't come or anything like that or is it going pretty smooth it's going pretty smooth you know we've been having like uh from Barco Quebrado, from all over the communities, like, you know, Arenales, Santa Teresa, like, all over. So it's really cool. There. That was my next question, is what <laughs> areas are they coming from? Like, everywhere, everywhere. So it's, it's really cool that, you know, like, some kids are like, oh, my friend wants to come. And, like, they, can they come? And I'm like, well, I need to go to talk to your parents first and explain how the kids club runs. And then, like, they can call me and, you know, like, we can set it up, like, you're half priority. So you will come first, for sure. I get you. So how far in advance do they need to contact you to get in on this? We check the, how do you say, the uh, disponibilidad that we mm-hmm. have. And so we have set up like a schedule um, for each Saturday and see we have 15 spots every Saturday. So like we give priority to the kid never served before and then like we put them first. Okay. And mm-hmm. is it normally pretty booked out like is it weeks in advance or can someone contact you this week with the chance of going on saturday or we're pre-booked yeah yeah so maybe it's best to book in advance a week or two for sure or three? for sure yeah 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 because like you know like kids who come before they want to when i'm coming next and i'm like well we're doing a rotation so and parents understand like that like you know they're very um happy to to wait in line and say like, okay, maybe in a couple of weeks my kid can come back in. And sure. you guys are providing the surfboards. They're being stored in the trailer, correct? Yes. So they, how, how are most of the kids getting there? Their kid, their parents dropping them off? Are they taking buses or getting rides? Everything, walking, bicycle, bus. All the above. We, like, should probably, we should probably give a shout out and a thank you to some of the people who've been um, rounding up the kids and driving them all. You know, uh huh. Yeah, like Rebecca's been rides. doing it. Uh huh. Re- we have a uh, Ophelia and Rebecca from Delicias, and they, you know, come in a like, pickup truck, and nice. They all the kids show up, and they're like five kids, and we're like, oh, okay, we're here. So I we- can see Ophelia doing a really good job of that. Uh, and, and actually, see. we should say on the subject of just thank yous, we should say a big thank you not only to Gabby, who's done like all of the hard work. Nice, Gabby. Okay. She's like, <laughs> Gabby's like the perfect balance of like, she's like full of love, but she knows how to like crack the whip as well. You know what I mean? So she's like the perfect person. <laughs> you just brought back a memory of her as my Pilates instructor in, in 2010. Um, oh busted our cojones. Yeah, Gabby's tough. That um, is a good decision. And and then, and the other people are Kali Artavia, who's amazing, who mm-hmm. also runs the Nasara Surf team. Um, Ollie Davis, who's there every week as well. Slater Molina um, and his brother, Kayla, uh, and him also run the Ostianel Surf Club with Cali as well, which is like the same thing, but up at Ostianel. Mm-hmm. Good kids. Which we, which we sponsor as well. Um, Faye Watley, Eki Altman. Have I forgotten anyone? No. That's everyone. Yeah. Sí. So those, those five guys and Gabby, are there there every single week doing it. 
And then the surf simply coaches kind of they jump in like usually one Saturday a month each and kind of rotate and they'll jump in and get involved as well. So, Gabby, how do you keep all those guys together? It seems like it's herding cats kind of. What is that? How do you keep how do you keep (laughs) all of those guys together and organized picking up the kids and going to the right place? You're just Um, living on your phone constantly. um, Well, I um, how do you say like I did like I. I have my mornings off, so I split my time, like, you know, where I do my regular work at Sir Simply and running the kids club. So I dedicate, like, certain mornings to the kids club and, like, I get you. what's so, up, like, group, and let's do this. And this is how we're going to run for Saturday and talk to the parents and confirm with them, like, already for, like, each Saturday how it's going to work and who's going to come and who is going to have who. Because we split, like, the kids who never surfed before and the kids who were, like, um already have the experience so we just like um separate with the different uh coaches i got you so every day you just ship away at it this this person's coming that coach is available and you just blend it together for every saturday we have the 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 five coaches like for the kids club so they're for sure there and so we have 15 kids and we just like have a list with the picture and the name and we're like Okay, you're going to be with this coach each Saturday. And also it's really cool on the trailer that we have a whiteboard and we write the names and we're like, this is your coach. And then like, you know, the, the coach are like, this is me. And so the kid know like, who are you going to be with? So it's really cool. We, we kind of did, did it. It's almost like a mini scaled down version of what we do at Surf Simply. So at the end of each Saturday, all the coaches will write notes on what mm-hmm. all the kids, what they're at, like what's holding them back. And, you know, if there's anything that we need to be aware of and whether they're surfing. And then on the Friday before the next week, once Gabby knows who's coming along, her and Ollie will then organize everyone into groups and then brief the coaches on which kids they're looking after and what they're working on. And it's all started as like super chaotic. And with every week that goes by now, we're just figuring it out and getting the systems down a little bit better. Um, And we keep kind of stealing ideas from Surf Simply from the resort and the way we do the coaching weeks there and then just kind of tweaking them and scaling them down and trying to use them with the this has got to be one of the most fun things that you guys get to work on i would oh think. yeah i have so much fun it's it's really cool to see the the kids like you know they're like mommy um i don't know like super scared or super shy and then like um watching that transformation yeah like and they go and like okay do partners we show them a safety video before surfing so they go do partners they you know like surf for an hour and a half come back to the trailer and we video them so they're like oh that's me like oh look so they're really stoked by the end of the session and they for sure want to come back wow so you're watching the eyes light up and the pride kind of fill in see it's really cool to see the moms like thank you like my kid it was so afraid to surf and now he wants to come back or she wants to come back and i'm like yeah and then like most of them are like really afraid of the ocean and like you know yeah that's the really nice see, part see, like when, see, some, yeah. sometimes you get it sometimes you get a kid come along for the first time and they're really quiet you know and then see. and then like I, was, there was, I won't say her name because i'm embarrassed but there's one girl that i took down she's probably like 10 i guess and you know at the beginning she's like like not looking like she really wants to get involved. And then we're about to go in the water and she comes up and she's like, I feel sick. I have a headache. I think I'm going to go back. And I'm like, all right, well, look, why don't, it's quite hot. So why don't we just jump in the ocean, splash to cool off, and then we'll just go back. And she's like, okay, like begrudgingly, she just puts her head under the water. And I'm like, you feel a bit better? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, while we're here, look, we'll just we'll get, lie down on one wave. We're not going to surf. You're just going to lie on the board and I'll pull it and you can just lie on your belly. And she did that. And then I'm like, you know, let's try sort of steering on one. And, st- and then an hour later, she's like, I love surfing, you know. <laughs> and it's, I just think surfing has the ability. When, we, when I used to work back in England, we used to do weekends where we'd work with uh, kids that were in Bostles. So that kind of like juvie, I guess is what you call it in America. And, um, and just watching these kids who had all the defenses up and watching them all just drop away as soon as they got in the ocean. And these like hard kids, you know. And then suddenly when they're in the ocean, they were just kids again. And I, f- I feel like, I know it's a cliche, but it can be such a good leveler of everything. Like everything that's going on outside kind of gets washed away when you jump in the ocean. Really? And like, I, was, I was a kid with such low self-confidence when I was younger. And, you know, seeing myself in some of these kids and then watching them get in the water and watching them forget to be self-conscious and suddenly have fun, even if it's just a little bit. It feels you know, good. It's cool. And then they get to remember that and hopefully carry it with them a little bit. 
how much did helping teach your nieces to surf and enjoying their progress in the water kind of parlay into the kids club? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 now at Surf Simply, we don't have any under 16s. So it's just an adult coaching program. And that's, that's partly the way we've designed it. It's very technical and it's not geared around kids. But before that, I mean, I was working with kids and with kids clubs and junior competitors for like, I don't know, 15 or years or something like that. Mm. So I, I, you know, I've worked with kids a lot. My nieces, funnily enough, who I'm actually going to go and pick up from the airport right after this, they're coming down next week. They will not take any coaching from me at all. You know, <laughs> and any advice again, they go, shut up, Uncle Ray, I just want to get another wave. And I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know, one oh, thing. summarizes kids so well. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that I've, that I, I don't know, something I feel quite strongly about is I've been lucky enough to live for long periods of time at lots of different places all over the world. And I spent a ton of time in Indonesia, like a few years before I moved to Costa Rica and a fair bit of time in Western Australia as well. And, and in England, obviously. And I've noticed that beaches sort of go through this, um, rate of change that's almost like a parallel to childhood teenagehood and adulthood and sort of i guess the childhood of a surf spot is when there's no one there and it's just you know you jump in the water there's no emerald around you know and it's and it's wonderful and it's what, that's when people write articles about and refer to as back in the day and then as an adult the place is really busy everyone knows about it it's you can type it into google and there's a million images it's not a secret and and it sort of settles down as an adult place and people kind of know what the etiquette is and everyone knows how to behave and there's this uncomfortable sort of angsty teenage years when it's just moving from one to the other and I feel like we've gone through that here or we're going through that here in Nosara and I've seen a lot of beaches go through that and I've noticed they can really go in two directions and getting it right now is important and I'm so impressed more here than with anywhere I've been that there are so many really really good local surfers who are not just skilled watermen but are really gracious you know they give away so many waves and they're so kind you know a lot of the people that that come and surf here surfing in other parts of the world and they're just like everyone's so nice out of Guiana's you know mm. and there's you know there are a couple of notable exceptions and we don't need to say who they are like everyone who surfs in knows a couple of faces that we all roll our eyes when we see them paddle out but you know they're a, a tiny tiny minority and having all these kids go through this club, you know, they're all going to be surfing here for the rest of their lives. And, you know, if they grow up to be just kind, gracious people, we're going to have a really wonderful beach. So, I mean, hopefully this club will, along with Nosara Surf Team and the Ostianel Club, will just help point the culture of this area to be a, a really positive place that's nice for everyone. Mm. Yeah. Just real quickly, what's your favorite thing about Nosara, Gabby? There we have to surf. Mm. The, and also the green areas interrupting the community, preventing wide scale development. It's pretty cool. All right. Yeah. What's your least favorite thing? The pollution. Like, you know, walking down the beach or even here and there where I live and see all the trash. You were one of the early advocates of fix the road, no dust, please slow down. I remember you used to make signs back in the day. Remember you used to stand out there and hold up your slides? That sucks. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm glad yeah. you're here so I could give you a shout out for that. I always uh, have respect for that. That was cool. Yeah. It's All just right. bring conscience to that. I guess. Yeah. All right. Ruth, same questions for you. Um, just selfishly, my favorite thing is, is the people, you know, like I've lived here for 13 years now and all of my friends I've met here or are from here and, um, yeah, I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. It's just it, the commu I love the community. It's just, it's like there's enough people here that you can have a, like a big network of friends and there's always a little bit going on, but you know, I'm not really like a city person, so it's not too big. So it's, it's just enough. It's just enough. And yeah, there's just so many wonderful people. Here. That's, that's my favorite thing. And my least favorite thing, I know it's cheesy, but like the dust, it's like, it sucks. It really does suck. huh? So if I, if I like, if I, you know, had like a billion dollars that I won in some kind of mega lottery, I would be so stoked to just like get all these roads fixed and the knock on effects would be great as well. I mean, it would just help at the quality of life for everyone. And when you, you know, when you go, when you leave Nassau and you get to drive on that road towards summer and suddenly everything's green, you're like, Oh yeah, it's all green here. Cause it's not covered in dust. You know, it's so pretty. So yeah. Hopefully there's some help on the way. Well, well I've done like four podcast episodes on the road now at various stages of 
they stopped working on it till they're back working on it till they stopped again and now they're back so we'll we'll see how it goes um but hopefully at least Ruta 160 gets taken care of with the sealant and then after they do the sealant hopefully they actually do the asphalt because if they don't do the asphalt they just do the sealant the road's going to be just like all those little town roads that are all busted up. Yeah. yeah. The road could be even worse. So. And then you still have the potholes, but now they're like tarmac edged potholes. They're mean potholes, <laughs> like they're uh-huh. angry ones. Yeah. Oh, man, it's tough. Oh, to be a mechanic around Osara. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we all live here and we love it. And the, the positives outweigh the negatives so much. I would think so, too. And no, sorry, we have a bunch of restaurants. You guys know restaurants extremely well because, well, your Surf Simply, you've been to so many of them. You've had to get this thing down to a system. I'm not asking about the Surf Simply ones. I'm asking you personally, what are your top three favorite restaurants and what do you like to get? Um, <laughs> In no particular order. La Luna. Okay. What do you like to get there? Uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people say that. Um, yeah. It's really good. I, so I La like, Luna's on the list for sure. Yeah. Um, al Chile. The nachos. The barracho nachos. People uh, talk about those a lot too at Al Chile. The pollo ones. The pollo ones. So the uh-huh. nachos at Al Chile. Uh-huh. E, can I say four? I like <laughs> sure. almendros a lot. And El Basilico. Those are good ones. <laughs> those, are good, those are pretty good places. <laughs> sí. How about you, Ru? Uh, yeah, La Luna. I mean, it's, I had breakfast there yesterday. I love that place. <laughs> breakfast um, at La Luna is the secret. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's the secret. I was like a little morning surf up north and then drive back and have a little breakfast at La Luna. Maybe one of the Bloody Marys with the obnoxiously big bits of celery sticking out that you can't drink without sticking in your eye. Um, and I really like the Sushi Ma, you know, in Gabby's mm. playground, the little sushi place in there. I go there all the time. And uh, Diego's Pizza Place. I was going to say New Pizza Place. Olivia's. But I guess it's been, yeah, Olivia's. Yeah. It's been open for a few years now. But I love those. Uh, I think I think he's done such a great job in there, and those guys are all really, really lovely. And um, El Local as well. I really like going there. Yeah. I like going, honestly. I like going places where everyone who works is really nice, and like everyone's really nice at Olivia's, and everyone's really nice in El Local, and and I like that fish and chip place. But nostalgic. I I'm not a big like England England guy, but I do miss fish and chips, and they've got that new little fish and chips place outside Alo Alai. That's the really, Gaelic really place. Tasty. Yeah, the okay. Gaelic fish and chips place. Actually, actually, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, those are all good ones. All right. So, do aliens exist? I don't know. No? Do you mean, do they, do you mean, like, might they exist out in the universe? Or do you mean, do they, have they come to Earth? What's your opinion? Do aliens exist out there, number one? <laughs> now, you, now when I ask that question. question sometimes, some people get into, yeah, I've seen them. Oh, my God. And then okay. other people say, well, maybe there's a possibility that other people say no. So I'm interested to know what you guys think. I have a pretty strong idea of what Rue's going to say. Maybe we should also start asking if the Earth's flat. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> we totally should. Uh, let's ask Rue that. His head might explode. So, <laughs> yeah, so they're aliens. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I'll say maybe. Maybe is a good answer. Let's see. Well, there's definitely not aliens on Earth visiting us and like alien spaceships flying around. So there's not planet. lizard people walking around town that you see every day? No. Um, <laughs> I, like, <laughs> we could get into it, but like, there's just not. <laughs> um, and I, I know that whole Fermi paradox thing is interesting. You know, that whole idea of if, if, if we've been around so long, then there should, we should see, you know, the universe is all it is, we should see aliens out there. And so what's really terrifying is this idea of filters, which is that I was just watching a YouTube video on this and I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you ask, right? So there's, there's only two explanations for why, for given how old the universe is and the, the plausible mechanism for life developing. So there's a lot of like assumptions being made here, but none of them are outrageous. We should see some evidence of aliens out there somewhere. And if the fact that we don't means that there must be some massive filter to intelligent life developing and either it's behind us, in which case, you know, we're the only one who got through it, which means we're likely, you know, in this, the only self-aware beings in this whole amazing big universe, or it's in front of us, in which case we're doomed. And both are quite terrifying. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, thanks for that, Ru. <laughs> um, <so laughs> <laughs> well you did not ask that's a great answer i enjoyed that all right so next question if you had to just have a meal or a cup of coffee with someone in nosara you may already know them or you may not either way who would you like to sit down and just get to know a little more if you could see 
I'd like to know where that, that lady or that guy's coming from. And you'd like to get to know them a little bit more. Like who in the community would you like to sit down and have a cup of coffee with? Wow. Nothing comes to my mind right now. Well, uh, keep thinking and then let Ru go and then we'll come back to you. Okay. I, I actually have a very specific answer to that. And I'm not going to say the name of the person, but I, I alluded earlier to like a couple of specific people that are like very aggressive out in the water. Always trying to get every wave they can, you know, trying to like paddle around uh, less, um, uh, trying to paddle around surfaces that are less able to predict waves and are less agile so that they have priority. And then when they have priority, try and sort of surf as close to that person and then throw their hands in the air and make a big thing about the fact they were dropped in on, you know. And it's like, to me, that way of behaving is like walking up to an all-you-can-eat buffet and because you're bigger and stronger than everyone else, just pushing them out of the way, grabbing all the food and just going, well, it is an all-you-can-eat buffet and I can do this, so I'm going to. Um, and it's so it's so totally alien to how I see the way that an adult should behave in the water. And I would love to, and I don't, you know everyone's the hero of their own story so i'm sure in these guys heads they're like the hero of their story they're the good guy and i don't see how they can see that so you know i'd love to sit down for a cup of coffee with those guys and just like let them talk and just hear hear what's what's going on there you know that's a really good answer so you'd like to talk to the bullies the wave bullies yeah the bullies yeah (laughs) right on that's a great one i hope you do get to talk to them someday gabby i don't know like i don't know who I would love to have a cup of coffee. You, well, maybe not love it, but just you you're, you would like to learn more of where they're coming from. I think for you, it's the head <laughs> it's the head of Kanavi. And you could have your dust suck signs. You could be like, why do you make us live with this dust? Maybe with the tourists, like be more conscious of the, the way they drive. See, but it's it's hard. They just here for a short period of vacation. Yeah. So, yeah. But we all, we all do that thing, right, where you're driving along and when someone's driving like crazy you're kind of like come on slow down like there's nothing that's that important you have to get there and then when we're late for something and we're driving along and someone's going really slow it's like hey we're not all on vacation you know (laughs) and that just yeah i think everyone does that see or maybe it's just me i don't know no i appreciate you being upfront about your hypocrisy i like that (laughs) because we all are you're spot on i i'm all full of hypocrisy and confirmation bias and riddled with cognitive dissonance but like at least if we try and take our own ideas outside our head and hit them with a cricket bat to see how robust they are that's the the best you can do i have three jokes right off the bat about the cricket comment but i'm gonna leave them all off (laughs) i know we're short on time and in harry and my episodes we do enough smack talking in between the british u.s stuff (laughs) we'll we'll joke some other time i have i have person donna loria ah see i like architecture i would love to have a like a full day of conversation with him about design that's awesome see but that's a really good <laughs> ironically we are just about to release his episode we have one in english and one in spanish that's about to drop here soon so at least you'll have a podcast but cool. donald donald is a pretty interesting story see with him he's one of the only architects from here mm-hmm. still still going here it's really cool his uh ideas like yeah he sees the world through a different light. Uh-huh. Like Donald's one of the only people I've ever met who could look at a piece of property, just stare at it, close his eyes, and they kind of roll back and he like channels wherever <laughs> he gets it from, and then just draw it and then hand it to you in a couple minutes. Same. I've seen him do that a lot. Of yeah, very interesting guy. That's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, for the Kids Club, are anything else pertaining to Surf Simply while you have this platform? Is there any other messages you'd like to get out there or anything you'd like to say? See? You go. Ah, que más niños eh, vengan a surfear. See, for sure. Like, it makes me happy to see them by the end of the, you know, the the kids club and they're like all stoked and ready to come back. So I hope like más familias join and come and surf. Sounds like it's working. See, <laughs> see, sí. see, sí. really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having giving us the opportunity to chat to you about this. It's, it's something that you know both me and Gabby and the rest of the guys are so proud of. So it's really cool to be yeah. able to sit here and and talk about it a little bit. Hey, thank you for doing it. I think it's awesome, and I want to do a lot more episodes like this that are fun and show a lighter side of the community and reaching what's most important, which is the people from here and giving them an outlet to enjoy what we came here for. So it's kind of cool to see it come full circle. And so thanks for diving back into the community and doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you. 
Gracias. Sí. All right, Root, we'll have you back, and you can debunk the flat earth theory at some other point. <laughs> but uh, let's call it a I day. Would love to, I'd love to do a – if you if – you, like – if, if you ever want to do a debunking commonly held Nosara conspiracy theories, and if you let me know in advance, so I'd make sure I've properly got all the facts <laughs> at my fingertips. I would love it. It would be so fun. I, probably- I, I, th- I think we just scheduled a future episode. <laughs> all right, guys.